for me to uh, be the speaker at this uh, PHFI Foundation Day. Um, and I'm especially um, honored by the presence of uh, Minister Ramesh and Secretary Pradhan. And of course, my very dear friend, uh, Srinad Reddy, um, who I, I uh, always have admired uh, the incredible precision of his thinking and uh, he's one of those people that uh, you hear him talk and it's as if you were reading uh, a literary piece. Uh, so one of the most uh, uh, influential figures today in, in global health and, and someone I'm, I'm proud to call my friend. And I'm in his debt for the opportunity to, to be here today. I'm coming with a whole delegation of friends and faculty members of the Harvard School of Public Health. We're here uh, on a uh, one-week visit, um, uh, trying to strengthen our bonds of partnership uh, with uh, several Indian institutions. And of course, the Public Health Foundation of India is a very exciting uh, new experience in expanding capacity in public health education. is um, a, 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 an incredibly um, dynamic organization that I think everyone in the world is very very much observing as it, as it moves to reinvent public health education for the 21st century. And uh, it is true, as we move at the Harvard School of Public Health towards first cent centennial, uh, we're, we're looking for a closer partnership with the Public Health Foundation of India, almost to, to watch how a new organization setting up new schools of public health almost presents a mirror to us uh, and as we think of how we uh, transform ourselves to be a, 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 a school for the 21st century. And in that process of deliberation, uh, we had the great benefit of the work of the Commission um, on the Education of Health Professionals for the 21st Century. And what I'd like to do in this um, uh, lecture is to share with you some of the main ideas behind uh, the Commission report. That report was published in The Lancet in uh, November of 2010. So anyone who's interested can read the whole text. I'm not going even to give you a summary. I'm going more or less, uh, or rather to share with you some of the rationale and the reason why thinking about health professional education is particularly important in this moment for the, the, for the world at large, but especially for a country like India that's rapidly reforming its health system. Already the enormous progress in maternal and child health uh, which everyone observes and admires, the great innovations of the rural health missions and the enormous progress, pro promise of achieving universal health coverage in India are all developments that will require, are requiring and will continue to require a competent health workforce and a, a key component of any effort to transform a health system, if not the key component, is to look at the human element because you know, after all, health is all about the encounter between people. Health is all about people. It's a group of people who need care, who need uh, the protection of its own health, and a group of people that society has provided a trust to take care of that health. And it's the human element of health systems that's actually the core of any, any well-functioning health system. And this is what this report is about. So um, the, 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 this is the cover of the report. It was published in 2010, both the Lancet version and then we had a book version uh, with the same text. The uh, reason for the 2010 publication was uh, that that year marked the centennial of the famous Flexner report. Um, something happened at the turn of the 19th to the 20th century that there was an enormous interest in the way we train doctors, nurses, public health professionals. So in 1910, the Flexner report was published uh, followed in 1915 by the Roche, the Roche Welsh report, which is here uh, on, 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 on your uh, right, uh, which did the same for public health education, and then a few years later by the Goldman report, which did the same uh, for nursing education, and then even followed a few years later by the Gia's report on dental health education. So something happened at, at um, the beginning of the 20th century that this became a very, very major um, concern. And that led to a worldwide movement, the Flexner Report, although it in initially focused on the United States and Canada, medical education in the United States and Canada, ended up having a worldwide influence, and most medical schools around the world actually in one way or another follow the Flexnerian model. Uh, and the same thing happened with the Welsh Report and, and, and the other reports. Um, 
And there's been a lot of progress since those reports came out, but also there's been a lot of change. So uh, as this, the centennial was approaching, it was thought that it, it was high time for a, a revision uh, of the circumstances that um, would require a new con way of thinking about the education of health professionals. And this is how this commission was formed. It had 20 commissioners. One very distinguished one was Professor Srinad Reddy, and uh, who made very, very major contributions. Uh, in addition to the commissioners it's themselves, 20 in, uh, experts from all over the world and from all health professionals, we had the advantage of a number of other instances, particularly a group of young commissioners, uh, students and recent graduates, who actually wrote one of the editorials accompanying the publication of the report in The Lancet, and that I think was uh, brought a, a, a fresh breath to our deliberations. Um, the title of the report says everything. So um, the key messages of the report are in, in red in this uh, slide. And those are the three basic ideas that I would like to leave you with. The report was called Health Professionals for a New Century because we were starting the second century after the Flexner report. And then the key idea was transforming education. How do we lead to transformative education? To strengthen health systems how do we adopt a systemic view in an interdependent world? How do we take account of the degree of interdependence that characterizes our world? And those are the three key messages, transformation, systemic view, interdependence. So <clears throat> what was new of this report is, first of all, it had a global outlook. There were many other reports during the year to mark the centennial, but this was one that truly had global, and by global I mean global, I think it, it not, not just developing countries as we often use the word. This, we think that the recommendations of the report are relevant both to low and middle income countries as well as to high income countries. It focused on all professions beyond the traditional silos. For reasons of um, time and money, for the quantitative part of the report we had to focus on medicine, nursing and public health. But again, we believe that some of the analysis applies to all of the health professions. It had a long-term perspective on post-secondary education, although as you will see, we also emphasize the linkages with the non-professional part of the health workforce. But in this case, the emphasis was truly on health professionals. It had an integrative framework and then uh, a series of specific recommendations. I'd like to um, spend these uh, moments before the, the, um, we, we engage in what I hope will be a dialogue, uh, addressing five major points. First of all, analyzing what has this century brought about, then telling you a little bit about the framework, um, uh, give you really only a sampling of some of the major findings. The report is very rich, and I can only share with you a few of the uh, findings, as well as a few of the uh, reforms and then just tell you what's been happening since the report was published in, uh, at the end of 2010. So <clears throat> let me start uh, just um, reflecting with you that the 100 years that have passed between the publication of the Flexner Report and today are not any 100 years. This is the 100 years with the most intense, deep transformations in the health status of human beings in all of human history. There have never in human history been a hundred years of so much change when it comes to health. We started, as the globe as a whole, started the, the 20th century, 1900, with basically the same life expectancy that we had had for most of human history. Uh, that graph is a little bit stylized, that flat line. In reality, we had constant peaks, but you know, m most of human history, we had low life expectancy and then we had epidemic peaks that, on top of everything, killed you know, m m high proportions of the population. And then something happened around the turn of the 19th to the 20th century, the beginning of the 20th century, that suddenly we have that huge rise in blue, so that having started the century with 30 years of life expectancy, by 1985, it had more than doubled to 65 years of age, more than doubled. So in that period of time, in less than 100 years, humankind as a whole achieved a larger gain in life expectancy than in all its previously accumulated history. And one of the questions is why? Why did that happen? There's been 
a major explanation has been that this was just a result of the general improvement in living conditions. That as societies industrialized and economic growth happened, then you know, societies became richer. And of course, richer societies have better health, people have better housing, better nutrition, better education, and that that accounted for the improvement of health. And that is indeed true, but it's not the whole story. And this is shown in this graph uh, from the classical work of uh, the famous demographer Sam Preston, which shows that indeed if each of those dots is a country, and these graphs are summary indicator of uh, national wealth, income per capita, uh, against life expectancy, our summary measure of the health of populations. And what that shows is that indeed as income rises, life expectancy improves. But the important thing of this graph is that for every decade of the 20th century, that curve shifts upward. And what that means is that for any level of input per capita, we gain more life expectancy for each, with each passing decade of the 20th century. And this, is, this upward shift cannot be explained by income. There's something else. And that something else is knowledge. And let me give you an even more dramatic comparison. It turns out that in the year 1990, the country of Chile had exactly the same income per capita that the United States had in 1900, obviously in constant US dollars. But with the exact same income per capita, Chilean women in 1990 had a life expectancy of 79 years, whereas American women with the same income per capita in 1900 had a life expectancy of 48 years. And that gain of 30 years that's the effect of knowledge. Now, how does knowledge improve health? Well, first of all, knowledge becomes translated or into technologies, better drugs, vaccines, diagnostic methods. That's the best known way in which knowledge improves health. It produces technologies, powerful technologies. And indeed, the 20th century saw the appearance of antibiotics, the uh, um, growth and spread of vaccines, although they had been invented uh, before, but the, 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 the massive application of vaccines and other technologies. That is very important. But there are two other forms in which uh, knowledge improves health. First of all, knowledge becomes translated into evidence that then is internalized by people who use knowledge to guide their behaviors in key domains of everyday life. Personal hygiene, the reason why people wash their hands is because of the knowledge about the germ transmission of diseases. Uh, physical activity. Nutrition, the way we rear children, uh, sexual activity, almost every sphere of behavior is shaped by knowledge. Knowledge is internalized by people. It's not just expressed in external technologies. It's internalized and people become empowered by knowledge to lead healthier lives. And then finally, at its best, knowledge translated into evidence is the guide for enlightened health policy as India has shown with the rural health missions or with the recent report of the high-level expert group, which is an evidence-based policy document that hopefully will inspire policy in, in, in India. Those are the three mechanisms, technologies, behaviors by people who are empowered by knowledge, and enlightened policy. And the reason why the topic of today and the subject of that commission report is important is not because it was a group of professionals saying, gee, you know, how important are health professionals? And we were, you know, in a sense, uh, uh, trying to ascertain our own importance. It's because health professionals are the fundamental uh, knowledge brokers in the health system. They are the vectors of knowledge. Health professionals are engaged in producing new knowledge when they are researchers. Health professionals are the translators of knowledge. They are the main agents in charge of applying those technologies, of prescribing drugs or applying vaccines. Health professionals have a major role in transmitting knowledge to the public and empowering people to shape their own behaviors. And health professionals typically occupy policy positions uh, that may allow them to apply knowledge to improving the health of their country. So the reason why talking about the education of health professionals is important is because the main driver for health improvement in the 20th century, for the health revolution of the 20th century, 
was knowledge, and health professionals are at the core of that knowledge. Now, the 100 years were also unprecedented because we saw an expansion of health systems. I mean, really before the 20th century, we couldn't really talk of a health system per se. Um, health systems were marginal. Hospitals were not places where people went to uh, recover their health. They were places for the indigent to die and to receive shelter. Um, we basically had no uh, significant uh, armamentarium. Of course, there are ancient uh, healing traditions in countries like India, but certainly for the predominant model of uh, um, uh, allopathic medicine, there's very little we could say before the 20th uh, century. And what it saw was the development of complex differentiated health systems to the point that today health systems represent 10% of the world economy. As we will see, that's about six trillion US dollars, a huge sector of the economy, a major source of employment, a major source of innovation. And that was also a, something that happened during the 20th century. And what we're seeing today are unprecedented challenges. We don't have time to go uh, through all of them, but the whole world is undergoing an intense epidemiologic transition where even as we continue to struggle with the unfinished agenda of common infections and maternal mortality, without having finished that, we already have the growing burden of non-communicable diseases that are presenting unprecedented challenges, coupled with a demographic transition, a rapid decline in fertility that's leading to a rapid aging of the population. That happens at a time of enormous technological innovation. It also happens at a time when increasingly we think of health, of access to healthcare, as a fundamental right of people. And so the demands from the population for access to those innovations are unprecedented. And that, of course, happens at a time of enormous professional differentiation, from uh, a situation where health was mostly uh, in the hands of, of um, very few professionals to a, a situation where today we have many, many different categories and literally millions of people who are devoted full-time to the uh, helping people preserve or recover their health. So those have m m uh, posed unprecedented challenges in health systems. And as I said before, health professionals are at the core of this. I love the motto of the Public Health Foundation of India, knowledge to action, because that's exactly what this analysis shows, that knowledge, when it leads to action, is the most potent driver to improve health. And because health professionals are a key part of, of that equation, both of creating the knowledge, but also putting it into action, how we educate them becomes very important. So let me tell you how we thought about this problem, and I will only show two slides. Again, this is all explained in detail in the report. But we basically took a systems approach, a systems approach that tried to link the education system and the health system. At the base of both systems is a population. People are not external to the health or the education system. They are part of the system. Because among other things, people are co-producers of their own health and, as, and of their own education. Health is not something that's you know, uh, given to a consumer who consumes health. Uh, people are co-producers of their own health and uh, obviously of their own education. So populations, the population is part of both health systems, the health system and the education system. Populations have needs, health and education needs. Those get translated into demands. And when you, we go on the education system, when that demand is satisfied to the provision of, ed of education, that determines the supply, the supply of doctors, nurses, public health professionals. At the same time, the same population has health needs, which leads to demands. And when those demands are satisfied through the provision of health services, that creates a demand for the health workforce. And both the supply and the demand come together in the labor market for health professionals. And it's understanding how those two interact or not, how much they are in balance or in, uh, or, or in imbalance, that is a big part of what this report was about. Now, if we look at the education system, our report um, uh, adopted a very comprehensive view. We looked uh, not just, ma many reports that look at educational reform tend to focus on instructional design, and that's very important. And we do make a number of instructional recommendations, but we also looked at the institutional side. Where should uh, health education, health professional education happen? And that's important because if we go back to the Flexner report, the Flexner report was not just a report about what to teach and how to teach it, that's the instructional side. It was also a very profound statement about where to teach uh, medicine. 
Basically, the Flexner Report said that medical schools, which until then had been proprietary freestanding institutions, had to be part of universities, that they had to be organized by departments, that they had to, be aff to have affiliated hospitals. There were a number of statements about the institutional designs of medical schools. So following on that idea, we also went into the institutional design, except we don't, didn't just look at each individual institution, we looked at the entire education system, and something very important, we looked at the global level. In the 21st century, there are new forms of organization at the global level, new forms of consortia and strategic alliances that we think have to mark the, the way we educate in the 21st century um, uh, by, by creating those alliances across countries. So um, with that framework, let me give you just a, a flavor of some of the findings. Um, first of all, we, f we find a number of systemic failures. Uh, by and large, this is not about any country in particular, but by and large around the world, we see a gross mismatch between the competencies of health professionals and the needs of people and of health systems. We see very weak teamwork, very poor education to, uh, uh, for, for teamwork. Still major examples of gender stratification, not just the traditional, say, stratification between doctors and nurses, but increasingly a, a very large part, for example, of the medical workforce are women, but women are still stratified and there's still a stratification that leads to an underrepresentation of, uh, under of women in positions of leadership. Um, there's still a large amount of hospital dominance over primary care as educational uh, spaces huge labor market imbalances. It's not uncommon to see countries where in the same country you have villages without doctors and in the cities you have doctors without jobs. I mean, an incredible paradox uh, of having on or underemployed doctors in a place where there's still communities without a doctor. Uh, so still major imbalances, also shortages, um, excesses of some categories of personnel, shortages of other, and then finally, weak leadership around a systemic view, looking at the health system uh, as a whole. Now, uh, we carried out a very detailed inventory of all existing medical, nursing, and public health schools. It was a major piece of work. Um, and not surprisingly, we found huge imbalances. For example, this is the density of medical schools by, by region, the number of medical schools uh, per 10 million. And you can see huge, huge imbalances obviously with uh, sub-Saharan Africa with a very low level. India is in the middle, although it has a large absolute number of schools. The same thing for public health schools. Um, enormous geographic uh, uh, imbalances in the distribution of public health schools around the world. Uh, we did some resized world maps and when, uh, if, uh, um, again, we found a complete mismatch between the pop, the population or any indicator of health needs and the supply of uh, the health workforce or the availability of educational institutions. This is just a resized map uh, in terms of population. Obviously, India stands out uh, as the second most populous country in the world, soon to be the most populous country in the world. And of course, with a very contrasting, uh, this is also in terms of burden of disease, where sub-Saharan Africa stands out and a huge, huge contrast with the number of medical schools it's like a different world, and with the size of the workforce, the number of doctors, nurses, and midwives per the 10 million population. So a huge mismatch between needs and the supply of uh, the workforce or the educational institutions. Um, we found uh, that there is a, a, a large number of countries with zero, zero medical schools, 31 countries, um, as you can see, uh, a large proportion of those in sub-Saharan Africa, but also in other parts of the world, um, a, an, another uh, 44 co uh, countries with only one medical school, and then at the other extreme, a few countries with a large amount. In fact, four countries in the world uh, account for about 75% of medical schools in absolute numbers, not relative to population, and those, of course, are chi China, India, the United States, and Brazil, those four countries alone uh, account for a majority of medical schools. But you have, again, a huge uh, variation across countries. I, I don't expect you to even read this, just to tell you that we actually calculated the number of schools, the number of graduates, the workforce, 
uh, uh, for doctors, for nurses and midwives, and how much is spent. And let me tell you about the expenditures, because this was probably the single most important finding, um, and Srinath will remember when we were going through these numbers. We did this in collaboration with the World Bank, uh, particularly uh, Alex Brecker and his team at the World Bank. And uh, this was a shocking revelation, because this was the first time that uh, it was possible to rigorously measure the investment in, in, in the education of all health professionals. And what we found is that for the world as a whole, um, you know, the world as a whole spends about $100 billion um, in education. By billion, I mean a thousand million, just to be clear, and by trillion, I mean a million million. Um, so a hundred billion, which might sound like a lot of money, it turns out that it's less than 2%, less than 2% of the entire health expenditures in the globe which, as I say, is around 10% of the world economy. It says there are 5.5 trillion. The updated number is about $6 trillion. It's a huge size of the economy. But the uh, amount that's devoted to the education of health professionals is really minuscule. Now, <laughs> before this report, I had spent most of my professional life, about 25 years, studying health systems. And I was always struck by the fact that no matter where you look, there's always systemic failures in health systems. Health systems all, always perform below what they should be performing and what they could be performing. And suddenly I realize one of the major reasons. There's no industry of this size in the world, six trillion dollars, that devotes so little to the education of the very leaders that are going to make the decisions about how the other 98% is spent. No other. And this is, if one wants to understand the reason why health systems always fail to perform at their peak. Probably one important reason is because we're grossly underinvesting in the education of health professionals, which in the end are uh, the people who lead those health systems. Um, I love my economist friends. I'm even married to an economist, but we ask them for two methods, just to be sure, a macro and a micro estimation of the expenditures, and I was very relieved to see that, by and large, they converged. So this figure of 2% uh, of total health expenditures devoted to health professional education, I think, is reasonably good. And as you can see, and not um, surprisingly, the variations are enormous, obviously Africa with a very small amount, um, uh, uh, and of course, uh, North America and Europe with much, much larger amounts. And of course, we have the numbers, Asia is too, too large an aggregate, and we have the, the, countries, the numbers even uh, for each country. But again, the same picture of huge, huge variations. Um, one phenomenon that was interesting is the rapid growth of, especially of private schools. And we highlighted two examples, India and Brazil. Um, you see in red that uh, big uh, increase. Now, a lot of that is positive. It's, uh, you know, schools of good quality. But a lot of that is being driven by the fact that many Investors have realized that you know, there's a growth in health systems, there's gonna need, be a need, and um, I think this calls for very, very serious attention being paid to the accreditation of educational institutions. We don't want to experience a process of deflexionarization, of going back to the situation before 1910, which was exactly like that. Large number of private proprietary schools delivering medical education of very heterogeneous quality. We want to make sure that um, uh, you know, whatever private investment comes into this field happens within a framework of accreditation that assures the quality of the education. And that's a commitment both to the students, because to bring a young person into a school for five or six years and then deliver poor education is not fair to that person. And then it's a, a commitment to the population. We cannot be producing graduates that will not deliver uh, the quality care that's required. So uh, an, an interesting phenomenon this in the last decades of this uh, huge growth in, uh, to a certain extent, also in public schools, but mostly in private schools. By the way, these are not the only two examples. They were just happened to be probably the most dramatic, but it's a worldwide phenomenon. Uh, since we were here at the Public Health Foundation of India, let me just say that we did an exhaustive uh, review of the everything that's been published in 100 years about the education of health professionals, and unfortunately, 
most of the literature has been about medical education, a little bit more about nursing education, but very little about public health education, the education of public health professionals. So I, uh, very important that uh, uh, Professor Reddy, as the president of the Public Health Foundation of India, was a member, because I think what you're doing here in India, this growth in the number of public health schools, is unprecedented. It's probably the largest expansion of capacity anywhere in the world. So hopefully this will also be accompanied by a vigorous program for, for doing evaluative research about the effects of these investments and about the innovations as we introduce innovations because the field of the education of public health professionals has been underrepresented in the literature. Let me uh, end um, in the last few minutes with uh, just a, a, a little bit of, of what are the main uh, recommendations. Um, of course, we realize that a lot has happened in this 100 years. We talk of three generations of reforms. There was the generation around 1900, which we call science-based. Um, its main purpose was to bring science into the curriculum. Then around the 1970s, there was a second generation of problem-based reforms, which is very valuable. And then we are uh, at the threshold of a third generation, which I call systems-based reforms. And I talk of generations because I think like, you know, just like with human generations where you have grandparents and parents and children, these three generations coexist. We still need to have a science-based uh, curriculum. Problem-based learning is very important, but I think the key element of uh, systems-based education that tries to link the, 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 the educational and the uh, health system is very, very important. Um, this was the vision, two main desired outcomes which I'll explain in a minute, transformative learning and interdependence in education, all to promote equity in health, both for individuals, for patient-centered care, but also for population-based uh, care, the essence of what we do in public health. Uh, there were 10 uh, recommendations. We don't have to, time to go through all of them. Six were instructional reforms, four were institutional reforms, um, uh, and then a number of enabling actions including, of course, enhancing investments, aligning accreditation, uh, strengthening global learning, meaning more research so that we all learn from each other. Um, of the institutional reforms, I'll, I'll just point out to the idea of joint planning. We need much more joint planning so that the requirements of health systems are reflected in what the educational system is producing. This doesn't mean that universities and institutions of uh, higher education become subservient to the health system. In universities and other inst education institutions need to keep a major role in being a source of innovation and critical reflection on the health system. But it means that they need to be responsive to the health needs of populations and the requirements of the health system. Uh, the other uh, uh, one I would show here or highlight is the one that calls for global networks. We think that, you know, if, if anyone thinks that the 194 sovereign nation states, members of the United Nations, each of those 194 countries is going by itself, by its own, to produce its full, to train its full, full complement of all required health professionals, that, that's just not going to happen. And we need to take advantage of the IT revolution, in which, of course, India is a leader, to develop global networks, consortia, and alliances that cooperate uh, on, on the education of health professionals. And um, you know, we're very much hoping that we will develop such a, 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 an alliance with India but the, 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 and, and, and beyond, and that we can really create global networks in, in, in education. Let me <clears throat> just um, mention two of the instructional reforms, the idea of competency-driven education and inter- and transprofessional education. Competency-driven is one of the key uh, recommendations, again, other reports have also emphasized this, but this is very important because competency-based education basically turns the educational process on its head. The traditional model is that we start, the starting point is the curriculum, and the curriculum typically, typically reflects the interests of the faculty or the way they themselves were educated. Then a group of faculty design a curriculum, we derive some educational objectives, and that's what we assess. And what we're proposing, along with many others, it's a competency-based approach. And here, the starting point is not the curriculum. It's the health needs of people and the health requirements of the, and the requirements of the health system. And once we understand what people and health systems require, 
Then we derive the competencies as the outcomes of the educational process. And that's what you assess. You assess the actual competencies that were acquired. And then you design the curriculum. The curriculum is the consequence of the competencies that need to be developed in the students in order to meet the requirements of the health system and the needs of the people. And it's a very, very different approach. The second recommendation I'd like to highlight is the idea of inter- and transprofessional education. In the dominant model, there's a common pre-secondary pre education, and then students are rapidly placed in the silos. They go to medical school, to nursing school, to public health school, to dental school, to other schools. Of course, the reality of healthcare is healthcare has become so complex that it requires teamwork. Yet nothing in the educational experience of the students prepares them for teamwork because they're trained in separate silos. And then we're surprised that once they're out there in the real world, they don't know how to work as a team. Uh, well, how would they? I mean, it's not a part of the educational process. So again, there's been a whole movement for intra-professional education that basically takes the idea of learning the competencies around teamwork, makes this a systemic part of the educational experience by mixing students from different professions and by creating opportunities for um, developing the competencies for teamwork. We took that idea, which many other reports have done, a step further, and I think uh, an original contribution of this report is to talk of transprofessional education, including also the non-professional part of the health workforce. Very importantly, community health workers. I think in, in our countries, in countries like India and other developing nations, this is absolutely crucial. And it, it really is a challenge to develop educational experiences where we can develop those competencies to bring the community health workers and other non-professional members of the health workforce into the same idea of teamwork. That, among other things, requires cultural uh, competencies to be developed as well. So that's uh, another of the important um, recommendations. And then lastly, uh, in terms of our desired objectives, I said there were two. One is uh, the notion of transformative learning. And the idea is to think of three levels of learning, which we call informative learning, formative learning, and transformative learning. Informative learning is about transmitting information, as the world implies, and specific skills. And that's very important because the outcome are experts. And we want our graduates to really be good at what they do. But it's not enough. We need formative learning. And that is all about the socialization of our students into a set of values. And that's the difference between an expert and a professional. A professional is an expert who has internalized a code of conduct and an ethic of service. And that is part of the learning process. But that itself is not enough. We need to take things to the next level and move towards transformative learning. And that means developing sp explicit leadership attributes so that our graduates become change agents. It doesn't mean you know, activists. It means that every health professional, although some of them might be activists, which would be actually very good, but it means that every one of us in our daily work must be aware of the context in which we practice and must have the critical tools to analyze its shortcomings and become changes to improve not just our own personal practice, but the entire health system of which we are a part. So the idea of moving toward transformative learning, and obviously the report has much more detail, but most of our recommendations are there. And the second big idea in terms of outcomes is interdependency in education. This is the way we tend to think today about interdependence. You have high income countries and low income countries, and you know, we have these ideas that, uh, that technical expertise and money flows from the rich to poor countries. And then, of course, there's a huge migration from poor countries, typically more to the bottom of the pyramid of high income countries. Um, we think this is a wrong state of affairs, and interdependence really means moving towards a processes of shared learning. There are a lot of innovations that are happening in low and middle income countries that high income countries can learn uh, for, can, can learn from. And you know, as I was saying, one thing we're looking for in our relationship with the Public Health Foundation of India is also a way of thinking at Harvard about how do we become a public health school for the 21st century. 
How do we uh, learn from the innovations you are creating here? And that's the idea of a fully interdependent system with alliances that allow this process of shared learning and where we can all be together in the um, generation of ideas, innovation, faculty training and capacity building. Um, one uh, last slide to show you what's happened in this year. There's been an incredible level of interest. There have been 20 worldwide launches. These were not organized by the commission. The commission actu actually the commission actually dissolved after the report was published. But uh, there's been 20 launches. I know that here in India there, there, there was one with some of the discussion of the implications. Uh, there's been, the report has been translated into six languages. Again, quite spontaneously, um, there's a translation into Chinese, and China has created its own commission that's trying to bring this analysis internally, but also uh, into Vietnamese, Arabic, uh, French, Spanish, and interestingly, to German. And if you know your geography, all the German-speaking countries of the world are in Europe uh, and are high-income countries. And uh, it turns out that they found this report hugely relevant for their own reform of their education of health professions. So um, uh, all of those have, this has been a, a, a sort of bottom-up process. They, 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 they have been generated by local uh, uh, individuals. There's been a number of uh, initiatives in the USA, the Institute of Medicine, the uh, Consortium of Universities in Global Health. I put Harvard there to reflect our own efforts at the Harvard School of Public Health to uh, redesign our educational strategy for the 21st century. Um, and a number of, of initiatives, of course, India is very prominent because of all the efforts you're carrying out. And then there's also the regional networks and two stand out in Africa, the MEPI, the Medical Education Partnership Initiative, and in, in, in Asia, very importantly, the uh, five country network that includes India, uh, Bangladesh, uh, China, uh, Thailand, and Vietnam, and that's been uh, very important with the process of shared learning, and that's where the um, China Medical Board, led by my co-chair in this commission, Professor Lincoln Chen, has played a, an important role in, in uh, supporting that Asia network that includes India. Um, so lots of interest, lots of follow-up. Uh, the report deliberately had a high level of recommendations. I think our challenge now is to translate that into the specific circumstances of each country and then move some of those recommendations into what could truly be uh, the, uh, health, the education of health professionals for the 21st century. So let me leave you with the exact phrase we used to close to end our report, because I think it's a very enlightening phrase. And it comes from a recent book by Louis Menand, a professor at Harvard, uh, who wrote this book called The Marketplace of Ideas. It's a reflection on the role of, of, on the, role of the university for the 21st century. And uh, he wrote the following. The pursuit, production, dissemination, application, and preservation of knowledge are the central activities of a civilization. Knowledge is social memory, a connection to the past, and it is social hope and investment in the future. The ability to create knowledge and put it to use is the adaptive characteristic of humans. It is how we reproduce ourselves as social beings and how we change, how we keep our feet on the ground and our heads in the clouds. And I, I particularly love this last way of, of, of thinking. Now, health professionals are important because the core of their work is knowledge. They are the producers, the translators, the brokers of knowledge, the vehicles through which knowledge reaches people and allows them to lead better lives with better health. And I hope that through this process of reflection, we can keep, yes, our, our feet firmly planted on the ground on reality, on an understanding of our local circumstances, but that we allow our heads to go into the clouds and imagine a better future. And I am absolutely convinced that the Public Health Foundation of India will be, for this country and for the world as a whole, an enormous source of inspiration and innovation as you carry forward your ambitious plans. Thank you very much for the honor of being here today. <laughs>